model, and this is our will. Uh, again, it will be it will be up to us to make it. Our purchasing decisions will change uh, everything. So if we buy local, there will be a local economy. If we don't, there won't be. Uh, and can we sac sacrifice a few more dollars uh, for a local economy as opposed to the fake, cheap uh, goods that they say they can uh, bring from abroad? That's the question that uh, we need to answer, and I do answer it every day <laughs> by buying local. So, Jeff. I'm going to pick on you and okay. tell us what you do. That okay, sure. Is the circular economy. Uh, yeah, uh, you asked me to come and talk a little bit about what we do. I uh, own a company called One World Enterprises. We're Bloomington. Uh, so I started it 34 years ago. We started as a pizza delivery place called Pizza Express and then did a restaurant. And we started the first craft brewery in, in southern Indiana about 21 years ago. Uh, and I've always been just really into this stuff. Like the whole, I grew up in a little family business in a little town in Ohio, and I've always loved the idea of local and regional enterprises and brands and how those could work. Uh, how you, you talked a lot about the accountability. That's what I kept just here, and maybe you didn't use the word, sometimes you did, but the idea, I've, I've long felt that organizations, corporate or otherwise, if if we're smaller and locally and we live, you know, we're we're community members, then we're we are accountable. If you know uh, if you if anybody watched the Elizabeth Warren uh, interview of the uh, what's the bank, Wells the Wells Fargo, Fargo thing, you just saw total lack of accountability in the, in that. And and that's just the nature of that beast. So how do you make smaller organizations, how can they have this the scale to to compete with large organizations that becomes the challenge. I think uh, in my business, in the restaurant business, fundamentally, is what I do, we're kind of blessed with the fact that uh, smaller organizations can compete very readily at the unit level against big companies like Pizza Hut and Domino's and and these things because the the real value that's created by their massive scaling. All that money is kind of going to the top of their organizations, but but we sell a sixteen dollar pizza and they sell a fifteen dollar pizza, so it, and we can make the same kind of level of profit. So that's allowed my that's allowed us, I think, to really explore a lot of these ideas. And and at Pizza X, we've been had sustainability initiatives forever, and the craft beer thing, which a, a lot of you know, it, it really just started 30 years ago. In the 80s, there were only 70 breweries in the United States. Now there's 4,000. We're still only, a, maybe we're only 10%. The craft beer is only 10%. But it's driving local jobs instead of uh, tits and ass marketing that the big breweries used to do. Now it's like, now it's like doing good local projects. That's what the, that's, and, and that alone is a great, step forward and and uh, there's it's less sort of go drink a 12 pack than more like you know enjoy a couple beers with your dinner so i think all oh, that's good uh but i want to mainly talk about a cool thing two things that we're doing i recently just a few months ago we built a shared kitchen concept in bloomington uh we've had a commissary for years that does prep work for all our places uh, uh and we've done some pretty innovative things within that but about six years ago we started renting our off time uh, to people who wanted to use, uh, who wanted to start a food project, a food product of some sort. Guy came to us about six years ago and said he needed kitchen space, and we're like, okay, um, uh, let's try it. And that grew to like about a dozen people using our kitchen. Uh, all the, uh, most of any of the new cool little food projects that you see around, like Yule's in Coffee and and uh, Yugo Bars and, and um, uh, Lucky Guy Bakery and some of the food trucks are all using our space. And so that it's sort of a co-work food production model. And you talked about the fun, and I, the fun is extremely important to me. Like, it's more fun. I want to live in a, work, a community that has a lot of fun, interesting stuff. Uh, and, and so we, we're, we're going to be able to help support that and make money. The whole thing, you know, it's not altruistic. I mean, we're going to be able to make a, a return on that building, even though, uh, and even even renting it for way cheaper than other places do, like in Indianapolis and places like that, just because 
because we're kind of overbuilt our own thing. We needed it. We overbuilt our own thing uh, because we aren't afraid of competition. When I go in and I talked in the business school uh, a couple weeks ago, and all these honors business school students in i -Corps, the big question that came from them was, well, aren't you going to, aren't you just kind of making your competition? Aren't you just helping your competition get going? This is the mindset, the business school mindset, right? And I'm like, well, don't we sort of believe that competition is a good thing? Like, don't, <laughs> isn't that fundamental? And, and, you know, and uh, so, so, yeah, maybe somebody is going to compete, but, but, uh, but that makes us better, and, and, and we'll make them better. And so the community, you know, gets better, all that stuff. So that, that's kind of the way I think it's a, it's a love instead of fear approach, you know, in terms of what we're, how we create what we create. Um, but beyond that, I think there's a, I want to share this idea with you because I've just started to see it for myself in the last five years maybe, that there's an emerging model of how to grow a business like mine, at least. And I'm not sure how far out this model goes in other organizations. You're all in different organizations. You can decide. But here's what I saw from, from my business. I grew up in the time of cha chains, and we all did chains and franchises, right? And the franchise is this dominant, very, very powerful business model where somebody like Ray Kroc and McDonald's or Tom Monahan and Domino's, they come up with this phenomenal system that's so much better than everybody else, and they can just cookie cutter it out across the landscape and, and go. And, and there's a sort of a policing structure driven with intellectual property of the branding and everything that says, you do it our way, you know, you do it our way, and you're going to make money, and we're going to make money off the top, and everything's going to be great. And, you know, and, and everything gets centralized and bigger and less accountable, and that's kind of all what, hap what happens. And if you want to start a pizza business, your friends are going to say, you're crazy, you need to buy a franchise, because why reinvent the wheel? They'll, they'll tell you how to do it, you just do it, and you'll, you'll be fine. I did never wanted to do that, so I started my own thing, and I'd like to help other people start their own thing, because I'm faced with this, okay, we're successful, we could go open pizza shops in Lafayette or, or um, Terre Haute or whatever, like that would be that logical model. But I've studied, we've been studying for years with a company in Ann Arbor called Zingerman's, maybe some of you know about Zingerman's? Yeah, so they, I credit them with sort of really spearheading this new model. They've gotten so good at what they do, and, and that good, I think, is fundamentally impacting a customer experience. They, they were good, very, very hands-on, and so they could charge more for their product. And they put that money into training to people to teach them how to, how to better serve customers and buy a little bit better product. And then the product got a little more expensive, and their margin got better, and they keep this virtuous cycle going on. And now you pay $18 for a Reuben sandwich at Zingerman's, but the, 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 the experience is phenomenal. The product's great, the service is awesome, and the people who work in that system leave knowing a lot about business because they, uh, Zingerman's practice is this open book management uh, model, which we also subscribe to. So maybe you're only an $8 an hour employee, but guess what? You're getting paid to go to staff huddles where you learn uh, how, about the finances of the, of the business. You learn how to, you learn a lot of things about how the business works and you, you are involved in the decisions that are made in the business. And it's a, yeah, go ahead. Could I interject yeah, two things yeah. about Zingerman's? Yeah. Uh, Zingerman's, uh, a couple things. Um, as they decided they were going to grow more businesses, they made the principle that they were never going to duplicate one business and repeat that business somewhere else. So every Zingerman's enterprise is a different business. And most of those businesses have been through investing in the manager's ideas. So right. the managers yeah. came forward and, and joined the program and said, I have this idea. They would say, let's do that idea. And that's why they have a deli over here, a bagel shop, a yeah. coffee shop. So that's all. Yeah, I yeah absolutely. That's it. And that they're staying in Ann Arbor. That's another thing. We do business in Ann Arbor. We're not franchising this out. You know, we're growing this thing. And in the process... They're growing, they're growing things that they do, but one of the big things that they did was they started a training company. You know, they're, 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 they spend a lot of money on internal training, and people started to say, I want to learn how you do this at Zingerman. So 
they started teaching people from all walks of life, businesses, go to Ann Arbor and learn how to learn these models, including open book and how to give great service. And, uh, and so a couple things happen in that. They've got this profit model going that's basically profiting uh, by teaching other people how they do what they do. So they're recreating, the, they're creating the world in their own image, which they believe in. And it's great because people can take it and use it uh, and go, go out and do it. They've also got a culture where the best people can become teachers. That's super cool. Because what do you do, what do you do when you've run a pizza shop for 20 years? You know, and, and, uh, and you're old and you know a lot of things, but, but you can't work, you know, eight, ten hours a day on your feet anymore. Well, the best people in those kind of organizations can become teachers and share that knowledge, which is why people buy franchises, right? You need them that knowledge you don't know. But, but we could teach people a lot of fundamentals about business rather than these kids only having the choice to go spend $70,000 on a business school education that teaches them how to go be a corporate yep. slog. So that's sort of, I'm really into that. That's, what, that's our future. That's a direction that I, and I think other companies like mine can, can do that. I'd like to see that in college towns and companies like mine. We also want to make the model that other people like mine could do shared kitchen things. If you've got a concept, why not, why not build it so that other people in the community could use it? You can make money on that, defray cost. There is one in Washington, D.C. Ah. Do you know about it? No. Huh. Like an, um, in an abandoned industrial building in South mm. uh, There's D. lots D. of these things happening. I think what makes ours unique is that we're a for-profit company that already needs this stuff and we can rent it to our competitors, frankly. Mother Bear's dough machine broke, you know, and there, the Ray McCon calls me and it's like, hey, can we use your dough machine? Come on over use our dough machine and that kind of stuff makes it you know we can work together and to me the whole restaurant uh, I don't compete I don't consider we compete against mother bears or avers and I consider all of us compete against the out-of-town carpetbaggers yes. <laughs> yeah. my, and you're you're all profiting without that franchise fee too you're that's right that's all that's money is staying here yeah. yeah what's your name I'm Jeff Meese Meese M-E-A-S-E um, one thing on the kitchen chair, I've heard a lot of cool things about ah. it from Steve Schroeder okay, yeah. and all the Zeitgeist stuff that he does. And it kind of sounds like, in a way, with all the stuff you've created and provided, the result has been an aggregation kind of a food processing. You know, just a lot of people coming together doing something in an area. And there's a parallel idea of a food hub, which is aggregating the actual production of the food, you know, the raw materials, that sort of thing. Do you see any synergies or anything between what you've got going on with the kitchen and kind of going the next step upstream? You know, well, I'll tell you one that's really clear that I'm excited about is, uh, so the Bloomington Bagel Company moved all their, their production to our place. And they're all for, they're old friends of mine. Together, we use almost enough flour to be able to buy a flour silo and, and buy flour by the truckloads instead of we buy flour in bags. Big bags to you probably they're 50 pound bags but you still got to handle them and move them around on pallets but if we had a silo we'd get truckloads of flour but to buy truckloads of flour you have to commit to a truckload a month uh, that's the minimum order you have to take a truckload a month and we aren't quite there but here's what excites me about that is that nobody the people who have flour silos and a flour silo would mean we buy flour for 40 percent less than we're buying now for a very important ingredient so that's a lot it's a lot of money who has a flour silo? Well, Pizza Hut's commissaries and the Wonder Bread factory and, and these kind of mass productive factories that basically turn that, leverage that cost savings into trucks and roads basically that they send stuff out a wide distance. But nobody has a flour silo that would be going into making local products. You get it where that value, that 40% of value would stay in the community and spread in all sorts of ways, instead of just being leveraged into fossil fuel and roads and truck drivers and all that. So that's, that's is that the kind of thing you're talking about? Well, I was thinking about actually more like, uh, you know, the food hub in connection to local growers. And, you know, it's hard for a retail restaurant to work with somebody who may have cabbages this week, but they don't have yeah. cabbages, you know, yeah. all that, that kind of That whole distribution piece with small agriculture, it's a huge challenge. I yeah. get it. I don't, yeah. I don't have the answers for that. 
uh, but uh, but it yeah it's a we're certainly you need space and you need people to manage it and sort of this information system. Uh, uh, yeah, so I'd love to see kind of thoughts. Yeah. something with information systems, something with some infrastructure, and my wife and I saw it's not really that idea exactly, but in the Dallas Fort Worth area, first you got millions of people, so you got big demand, and they have. Um, their food co-op is really kind of the CSA business model. And they're hooked into hundreds of growers mm. who are serving thousands of people. And so if you want to get your green beans or whatever every week, you'll get green beans every week, but it may in four weeks it might be four different farms. Mm -hmm. They've mm -hmm. got the capability, yeah. again, in a reasonable area to manage that kind of thing. And I'd be happy to explore it with people. I'm always yeah. happy to... Talk about it over a beer or something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'd, pa I'd pass on the invite to come up to Indy, uh, to Indianapolis at some point and visit Indy's Kitchen if you haven't already. I have been up there, yeah, 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 for sure. Just because that's been a very successful model of Food Hub, um, a community certified kitchen, uh, probably 60% of Indianapolis's food trucks produce out of there yeah. and, and then just carry that food on their food trucks. So it's a it's a great model that's worked wonder, wonderfully and they're probably almost at their bursting point where they need to get a second food hub in Indy. So, you know, I would just say that, that there's there's definite room for growth in what you've started here mm -hmm. and, and what you're succeeding at and there's probably immense room for growth almost to spin it off as its own business idea here because yeah. there's so much food in Bloomington. If we're going to have small organizations, we need to be able to find ways to share resources. I think that's the bottom line. Yeah. And this is also how you eliminate almost all waste because you clearly uh, can give a, a, a guaranteed demand to your supplier. So for sure, I'll buy from you for a year these quantities. Uh, and that is paramount to the model that we're talking about, where again, you're not going to create supply and then try to figure out ways of selling it because by creating massive supplies, you reduce apparently uh, your cost. Uh, and then again, you give, uh, you give guaranteed business to the kind of people that you want to keep in business. So maybe you should find a, a wheat farmer that has a flour mill to uh, I know at the farmer's market in Indianapolis, there is a guy coming from southern Indiana that has a flour mm. mill. Mm. Um, I can, uh, now, I don't know about price, but maybe he can uh, uh, produce the flour on demand, so you don't need to store it, mm -hmm. and then it's super fresh. Uh, and then it's made uh, yeah, by a mill that has been in, uh, kept operating in operation for more than 100 years. It, for me, and it's a water-based mill, so it doesn't use the coal to, mm. to uh, produce milk. It's just a fascinating thing. I'll, I'll look them up and uh, sure. let you know. If not, the business uh, student should uh, build a flower mill instead of reading all those uh, <laughs> quadrants. I, I've been to business school, I, I know how to. But it's really sad that, especially with young people, they still try to convince them that uh, raw competition is the way to go. The future is collaboration. It's pretty obvious, and I think the young people are already in this mindset. I also have children that are in their 30s. There is no way they're going to go for, for both of them. Are in yeah, millennials are used to information being free and mm -hmm. sharing information, and it's just right in their mindset. Yeah. I teach IV tech, so I'm around a lot of millennials. Yeah. yeah.